And the National Weather Service said is it this heat will stick around for the rest of the week. It's not unusual. Here comes the truth a little bit. It's not unusual to have this type of heat in mid-June, but forecasters say it's unusual to get so many consecutive very hot days and nights. So what do you say? Are we in the middle of like a historic heat wave right now? Or were we? Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> Great to join you again. Yeah, it's summertime, so the... Uh... <laughs> The climatists have to be out talking about how hot it is and how your neighbor's SUV is causing it. But um, our record in Illinois is, is 117 Fahrenheit, the all-time state temperature record set in 1954. And so, you know, we get up close to 100. That's really not a big deal. Although, you know, now they're using this heat index all the time because it makes the numbers look higher. <laughs> the news media. Well, um, are they get? Do they have one of these temperature gauges right in the center of Chicago, which is a heat sink? <laughs> and are they going to take that temperature right in the middle of the NASCAR race next next weekend? Is is that how they're measuring the temperature? Yeah, a great guy by the name of Anthony Watts had a <laughs> got a, a group of volunteers together and went and looked at all of the temperature gauges that NOAA has in the United States, and he found that like 80 or 85 percent of them did not meet their standards. Uh, the temperature gauges are supposed to be away from surfaces that absorb heat, like runways or parking lots or buildings. They're supposed to be out in fields, but more than 80 percent of them weren't. And so they suffer from a thing called an urban heat island effect. When you uh, when you put up uh, Parking lots and buildings, they tend to warm during the day and they release heat during the night. And so they raise the local temperature, not the global temperature, but the local temperature, and they throw all those thermometers off. So, yeah, even our temperature metrics are really not uh, where they should be. Yeah, you know, I I don't have a science degree, um, and it it just seems like common sense to me. Well, so. well, you know, in some ways it is, but people people say, wow, this is really hot. I don't remember this in my experience. Or they'll say, uh, you know, we never had a hurricane this big before, but, you know, they may be 40 or 50 years old and they don't remember the ones that occurred uh, 80 or 100 years ago. Or, or, for example, in the 1930s when we set 23 of the 50 state record high temperatures, most people weren't here in the 1930s. So, it's sort of natural for people to think uh, this seems like extreme weather. Or maybe something's happening. And then the news media plays that up, of course, and, and a lot of other folks that, that uh, want to change our energy. And But it, it's, you know, we are not in abnormally warm times. Our temperatures uh, have been warmer than, than uh, current times many times over the last 10,000 years and for multi-century periods at a time. So... Uh, despite what the United Nations and others are saying. Well, it was really no surprise that uh, this this topic came up during the presidential debate. And, you know, Dana Bash asked President Trump, would Trump take any action to end the climate crisis? So the first thing is, is this built in supposition that there is a climate crisis. And so you're, yep. you're kind of put on the defense. You have to defend this without telling the, the moderator that, you know, you're lying. There's not a climate crisis. Um, but I mean, w- what about that? I mean, how would you answer that? Uh, are you going to take any action to end the climate crisis? What would be your perfect answer on a debate stage? Well, my answer would be that there isn't a crisis. This is weather. <laughs> uh, we've had one degree of warming, uh, one degree Celsius in 140 years. And that's what you feel between 9 and 10 every morning. I mean, it's not a crisis. And and, and the second thing is that uh, filling the world with uh, electric vehicles or uh, wind turbines is not going to affect global temperatures. They're not going to be a measurable effect. But one thing uh, Mr. Biden said during the debate that was probably true, he said uh, Trump wants to undo all that I've done for climate change. <laughs> I think he's right on that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump uh, last month was in Wisconsin, and he talked about scaling back the Inflation Reduction Act, and uh, I'm going to quote him here. Um, He said, uh, upon taking office, I will impose an immediate moratorium on all new spending grants and giveaways under the Joe Biden mammoth socialist bills, like the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to save all that money. It's not helping you at all. And it's just amazing how much money is now going to renewables under uh, Obama, we were spending about $15 billion a year. Under Trump, that went down a little bit. Uh, but next year, 
the Cato Institute has projected $80 billion in fiscal year 2025 to be shoveled to all these projects like electric vehicle charging stations and uh, carbon dioxide capture, carbon dioxide pipelines, green hydrogen. Most of these things would not exist without all this federal money. But if uh, Mr. Trump gets in, you know, we're going to see dozens of projects canceled and, and probably a lot of companies that go bankrupt because they're not, they've been living on federal money for, for uh, several years now. Well, I have a couple in mind that should go bankrupt because we're not just spending federal uh, tax dollar money. We're spending state tax dollar money to do so. But back to yep. but, but on the topic of electric charging vehicles, I mean, uh, Pritzker just announced to much fanfare with a big press release. Oh, I'm spending twenty five point one million dollars to put in six hundred forty three EV high speed chargers in one hundred and forty one locations across um, Illinois. Well, that works out to $39,000 per charger. Now, I don't know yep. if uh, BP Amico, uh, if um, a Shell, um, a Casey's, did, I mean, did they get money to put in their uh, gasoline tanks? I don't think so. And they're no. now getting federal money, too. So, so they're getting a whole bunch on this, probably 50000 a charger. But, but the business case is very poor for chargers. A gasoline pump costs about $20,000 in, in capital money to, to uh, put in. You can serve a customer in six minutes. A 50-kilowatt high-speed DC charger costs about $100,000, five times the capital cost. And you can serve a customer in about 30 minutes. So the gas pump serves five times the customers for one-fifth of the cost. The other thing about charging stations is most people want to charge at home. 80% of uh, EV charging today is done at home. So imagine if you took the gas pump industry and said, well, we're now going to have people fill up 80% of the time at home. Right? All those gas pumps wouldn't be able to make money either. So the problem is that none of these things are making money. That's right. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a single charging company or, or these chargers that are making money anywhere. They're all relying on state and federal subsidies. Uh, just a poor way to, uh, to run a, a business or an industry. Well, I'm going to tidy this little conversation up with you, and then we're going to go to break and keep you on because I have two other uh, topics I want to talk about. One is the increase in um, in really the use of hydrocarbons uh, relative to the increase in wind and solar. It, it, it's just remarkable. Uh, I know Robert Bryce has put this out, and I know you have too in other places. But, I mean, you know, at the same time that the, we, the share of renewables has arguably increased, the truth is the share the the amount of hydrocarbons that we're using is really is really gone up as well because harb, hydrocarbons are what is actually useful and what works. So we're going to talk about that. I also want to talk about this um, you know eminent domain problem that we have when they want to put in clean lines. You know, there's a lot of other electrical grid infrastructure that needs to be put in place, and it's not necessarily bringing uh, wind and solar uh, through massive clean lines. Um, all the way to the East Coast. That's just foolish. It's a total waste of money, but that's what they're doing as well. So uh, we're going to take a short break here. We'll be right back with Steve Gorham. I want to talk about those two topics and then tidy up a little more. Now, more of The Real Story with your host, Jeannie Ives. All right, welcome back. And we are still on with Steve Gorham. Again, he is my energy expert, my go-to guy when we talk about anything related to energy. Uh, he knows it all. He's written a number of books. He's been on a number of programs, much bigger programs than mine. Uh, but I, I do appreciate that he's willing to come on here and, and, and talk a little bit more about this. And why? Because he's an Illinoisan, and Illinois is practically ground zero for all the nonsense that's going on in when it comes to uh, the, the green energy scam, as President um, Trump so um, called it uh, correctly in the debate. And so... One of the big things is that uh, in Illinois, they want to get rid of all hydrocarbon usage by 2035, 2040 time frame, like none of it. Unless you're sequestering 100 percent of your CO2, we want no hydrocarbon uh, um, usage in the state of Illinois. This is absolutely nonsense. In 2023, uh, about 82 percent of our energy usage was hydrocarbons. Um, about 13% was hydro, nuclear, or biomass, and only 6% was wind and solar. So, Steve, uh, tell my audience, I mean, this is truth. This is, this is reality. People need to hear it over and over again 
that we're not going to get rid of hydrocarbons. They're not going to be replaced by wind and solar anytime soon. Correct? Yeah, yeah, that that really is. We've not seen that that an indication that is going to occur yet. That transition uh, over the last twenty years, the world has spent about five trillion dollars on subsidies for mostly wind and solar, but other renewables as well. But for every year except 2020, when we had that big uh, fall off in, in energy use and driving and everything else, uh, the even though wind and solar have been growing, they have never been able to supply uh, the increase of the energy demand. Every year the world uses, uh, adds another roughly United Kingdom worth of energy consumption uh, goes up every year, and wind and solar and, and renewables have never been able to account for the total increase in a single year. So despite the fact that they're growing, uh, w- hydrocarbons are still increasing, as you say, and they still remain uh, something like 80% of, of our energy. So uh, we're a long, long way from any kind of a proposed energy trans- uh, transition. And there's there's a big thing coming, if we've got a few minutes, uh, uh, we're about to have a, a, a gap between a, electricity demand and electricity supply that's very, very big in the United States. And this is going to stop the green movement in its tracks. So could you talk to me a little bit more about that? Because, uh, again, in southern Illinois, where Ameren essentially went out in, in the last couple of years, and, and essentially they had briefings. They said, look, we could have rolling blackouts. We don't have enough power. Um, you know, some of what you're doing with your... Uh, the Illinois was specifically doing and shutting down coal plants and 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 wanting to close off gas plants. They essentially said, "Look, this is not good. We, the, the grid needs this energy, and it, 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 you can't supply it with wind and solar." And um, you know, and then then really nothing happened. You know, it didn't come to that point, and so, yeah, so they me, were able to weather the this. storm. Let me talk about this coming shortfall. This is pretty important. So today, the U- last year, the U.S. got 43% of our electricity from natural gas, 16% still from coal, a total of about 59%. The green energy movement wants to shut down all natural gas and coal. Uh, but, uh, our, and by the way, the, the U.S. power demand, the amount of electricity we've demanded has been flat for the last two decades. But all of a sudden, we have a number of big demand drivers that are just hitting the, the grid. Uh, three of these are green. One is a, a proposed shift to electric vehicles. Everybody knows about that, which use a lot more electricity. A second is a push for uh, to replace gas appliances with electric. In places like New England, this shift will be bigger than the demand increase from, from vehicles, from EVs. A third is a green hydrogen industry that the government is trying to create. And to do that, they use electrolysis of water. They run electric current through water, produce hydrogen, Huge user of electricity. But the biggest, bigger than all these three, is this new demand for artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. And and this just came on the scene about a year and a half ago when Chat mm-hmm. GPT came out. But we now have the big guys, uh, Microsoft and Amazon and Google Alphabet uh, and others, building these data centers, and they're upgrading current data centers. So the current data centers in the United States are mostly used for for cloud storage and for running the Internet, and they use 4% of our electricity. But when you upgrade these data centers to to run these this uh, 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 generative artificial intelligence, these data centers use six to ten times more power. And so people are forecasting that the that the amount of power to be used is going to grow up to 20% of U.S. electricity within the next 10 years. And this is just, uh, this is just clobbered the grid people. Here's a quote from Jason Shaw, chairman of Georgia Public Service Commission. He said, quote, when you look at the numbers, it is staggering. It makes you scratch your head and wonder how we ended up in this situation. How were the projections that far off? He means the demand projections. This has created a challenge like we've never seen before. They just went to the Virginia utility and said, we need two gigawatts of new power, the, the big guys went. That's like two new nuclear plants. Uh, Texas was forecasting 85 gigawatts by 2030. They just upped that to 150 gigawatts by oh 2030. Gosh. They're going to have to double their electricity. There's just no way this is going to happen. There's no way we can retire our coal and gas plants, which is what the Green Movement wants to do, and uh, meet all these, these demands. So 
Well, in Illinois, <laughs> you know, that's, that's you really, get a question. In. No, no, that's all, that's uh, that's perilous for Illinois because um, J.B. Prisker is doubling down, wanting more data centers here, wanting hydrogen plants yep. here. I believe that they're even thinking of putting one right near Mantino where they're building that massive Goshen EV battery plant. And they think that that somehow is going to supply the electricity, but it's just going to eat up as much electricity as it as it produces. Yeah, it is. There's no way they're going to be able to do this and shut down the power plant. So so a couple things are going to happen. Okay. The first is they're going to stop shutting down coal and gas plants, and they're going to extend things like nuclear plants. We're seeing that with the Diablo Canyon plant in California, which has been ex- being extended to 2030. They're restarting the Palisades nuclear plant in Michigan. Uh, in Utah, they've just decided to uh, uh, extend coal operating plants out to 2040. So that's number one. Number two is the big guys are going to get these big electrical contracts, uh, Oracle and Amazon and and Google, and everybody else's electricity rates are going to go up. And this is also bad news for for charge stations, which are trying to break even. Cost Mm -hmm. of electricity is going to be higher. Yep. Uh, For heat pumps, which they want want to substitute in for gas. So this is going to stop the green movement in its tracks, and you're going to see a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth. And your listeners should look for these articles talking about how uh, artificial intelligence is going is going to impair the green movement and and stop the energy transition. Wow, that's that is such important information you just gave my listeners, and um, I'm going to take this clip and pass it around to all the state legislators who are doubling down on Pritzker's bad ideas. We do we need Trump to stop all this, but my my fear is is that all they do is they, they they don't tell the public what's actually going on and the public stays in the dark and they see their electrical bill go up and they don't understand why it's going up and, and where that electricity is going. And then they also, I mean, th- th- it's all just a big lie, too. It, it, it's a 100% lie. I'm tired of being lied to by all the bureaucrats and all the politicians who, who think that they've convinced people that they have to get rid of uh, fossil fuels or hydrocarbons. And um, in the meantime... On the backside, they're like they're like silently like, oh yeah, well we're going to keep that going because we have to because they know the truth. They won't tell people the truth. We get bad public policy and we spend trillions of dollars on garbage. Yeah, I think I, I don't even know that the Biden administration understands this right now. What is about to hit them? Uh, another example: Amazon just purchased a data center right next to a nuclear plant in Pennsylvania. Why they do that? Because they're going to run AI in this data center and they need the power. And this is just going on. Matter of fact, Atlanta has has now banned uh, data centers and city limits, a because they don't like these huge buildings. These things are acres in size. Yep. And b, because yep. they don't have the power to to power these things. So it's going to really be a, a big big deal over the next year. All right, we've got to leave it there. Steve Gorham, thank you so much. That was really valuable information. We'll be right back with Edgar County Watchdogs.